All right, hurry and get your stuff. Sit down because it's almost six o'clock. So Paul Austin is going to have to sit in a new place because somebody's in his pew. <laughs> oh, dear. Life is going to be rough tonight. All right, tonight, tonight we have a special guest. Uh, he's an expert in his field, and there's a definition on what an expert is. An expert is someone who comes to speak who lives more than 50 miles away. <laughs> and so, so, Dr. Sawyer, do you want to be called doctor or pastor or reverend doctor? The reverend doctor. Greg is fine. Okay. Well, he is a reverend, he is a doctor, and his first name is Greg, and his last name is Sawyer. And he, can't, he comes to us all the way from Florida, so he is really an expert. Whereabouts? Whereabouts? <coughs> in Florida. Where in Florida? Uh, a pretty good sized state. North, <laughs> south, yeah. beach, He'll, He west. will tell you that. Ah. Beach. He is, he's, he's southeast. Yeah, from here. So where is <laughs> 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 all right. But tonight's topic is, is uh, spiritual warfare, and we're going to have a session tonight, and then tomorrow from 1 to 4, be back here. And then he'll be here Sunday, and he's going to preach both services and uh, adult Bible class at 930. So if you want to come back, it's, it's free, and we'll have goodies. So before we start, have anything? How about if we pray? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you bring the right people at the right time for the right purpose, with the right message. And tonight, O oh Lord, we give you thanks for the Reverend Dr. Greg Sawyer, who has come all the way up here to see his granddaughter, but to also talk to us about spiritual warfare. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, that you have kept him safe through his journey, and now as he explains and talks and informs us on the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask, O oh Lord, that your mighty angels would stand guard around this place, guard and protect us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that is over us and over our families and, and churches. Thank you, Lord. And now we look forward with great anticipation as you speak to us through your servant. And so it is in your hands that we command tonight, tomorrow, and Sunday, that we trust again in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 All right. It's all yours. Thank you for coming out tonight. Like Pastor said, my name is Greg Sawyer. Um, and so... A little bit of pressure that is a good crowd tonight. If there's half of you tomorrow, that means tonight didn't go so well. And if there's no one on Sunday, that means it went really badly. Um, and so please keep coming back or I may take it a bit personally. You're going to find out in the next couple hours tonight and then tomorrow that um, I, I don't know how to breathe without having sarcasm at some level in my voice or irony. And my wife tries to work on getting that filter in place, and it just doesn't work. Um, and so, although I take this topic very seriously, um, I do tend to think with really dark humor. And so if I offend some people, I just need to say that, because there are times I say things and go, it sounded better in my head, and I think it's hysterical, but then it crashes and go, well, that was just fun for me. Um, like I used to tell my students, I'm actually really funny. You just don't know it yet. You'll figure that out at some point in the future. I grew up in Los Angeles, which probably explains a lot of what I just told you. Um, my dad was a policeman, and my mom owned a um, hotel and restaurant. And so it's kind of an interesting um, upbringing um, back in LA when it was still 
I think, thoroughly sane. Um, left California over 30 years ago when I went to the seminary. No. Trained Lutheran, lifelong Lutheran. So born into the Lutheran faith, baptized in the Lutheran faith when I was uh, 27 days old, went to Lutheran school, uh, K-8, to and then Lutheran high school. Um, two years out of the Lutheran system at a Christian reform school, which isn't a reform school that Christians go to, it's actually just Christian reform, Calvin. Um, so two years out of Lutheran and into Calvinism, and then back into Lutheran um, college and then Lutheran seminary. So I'm one of those that I just don't know how to think any differently, which I praise God for. But most of what I do, I believe is pretty Lutheran because I haven't been any place else except reform school. Um, and so that's kind of where I come from, that perspective. I was telling pastor that I separate spiritual warfare, which we are all in every day, from a deliverance ministry, which is a, a specific part of spiritual warfare, but a different call and a different gift and a different um, just kind of place to be in ministry. And rather than moving into deliverance ministry, a lot of this is where spiritual warfare actually intersects each of our lives. You've been in it today, you'll be in it tomorrow, and what does that mean for us? Um, and that's where I was brought into this um, kind of aspect and, and part of ministry when I was um, in my first church position, dealing with a deliverance ministry, deliverance of someone I was working with um, and, and realizing there's a lot more to the spiritual world than what we talk about in, openly in church, especially in the Lutheran church. And so part of my seminary training in St. Louis was counseling. I went on to then get a PhD in um, counseling, in psychology, uh, counseling psychology, and worked almost 1,800 hours of an internship in a state hospital in Yankton, South Dakota, which in my time there is where Eric was born um, in South Dakota. And so once again came across spiritual warfare and then deliverance ministry, but in a state-run hospital, you can't pray over people. Um, so saw firsthand how in the U.S., there are people stuck because we write it off as psychological disorders. And we drug them. And that's what their life becomes. And I'm pretty deep in diagnostic work with there's a lot of mental illness. Full stop, done. Silo, container. But then there are some that if you don't have at least some Christian understanding of deliverance, you don't nuance out mental illness and it's something else. And so that's a ministry in and of itself that I do think we in the US and in the medicine world, we have medicated some to the point where they're not delivered, they're just medicated. And then spending time in the mission field, Asia primarily, um, and coming across places uh, where medication isn't available. And it's shocking how in the mission field or in the developing world, there is much more acknowledgement that this could still be happening. It's not a, a Bible story that 2,000 years ago ended. It's just that we have modernized ourselves away from looking at some of the details. And then spending four years in a Muslim country and the understanding there of an oppressive lying spirit that takes over an entire region of the world when it comes to religion um, and just the, the pervasiveness of that in, in Islam, that, that would be enough to get me shocked to say it's a lying spirit that blinds people, but that's what 
false religions are, um, and false spirits speak into the hearts of that, but it's no different than when I spent lots of time in India and the oppressiveness of India as well, because as we'll unpack more tomorrow, there are different levels of spiritual warfare in different parts of the, the world. And so that's kind of my, my background. I come into this very humbly. Um, at one point, I think I, I said to Pastor, I don't have a card that says Greg Sawyer Exorcist. That's not who I am. It's not what I do. I don't carry around oil in a crucifix. Um, but I am very keenly aware of where spiritual warfare and deliverance is something that we may or may not be called at points in time to speak into as, as Christians. So that's kind of my, my background. First thing, being a teacher as well. Oh yes, just maybe I forgot to tell you that. So I am um, currently, I am, somebody was asking where in Florida. I am right between Orlando and Tampa, right on the um, I-4 corridor. Some of the craziest parts of Florida are right there, between Daytona Beach and Tampa. Not just the drivers, but everybody on the interstate as well. Um, I, live, I have a house in, in Osceola with County, which is right across from Disney, from where our condo is. I can see Animal Kingdom, I can see Everest, I can see all of that. And that's where we thought someday we would live permanently. God laughed and said, you don't get Osceola County, that is way too multicultural. You get to go one county south to Polk County, which if this ever plays in Polk County, I'll be shocked. <laughs> um, love Polk County, but I'm still in a mission field because it is a foreign country to me. Um, just in, in its understanding of, of politics and uh, just life. Our sheriff, who I love and deeply respect, was asked one time, why did you shoot the person 27 times? And his answer was, I ran out of bullets. <laughs> and I don't think he was kidding. He's not sarcastic like me. He's just who he is. Um, and so that is where I live now. So California, Asia, New York, Morocco, Polk County. I am still in a foreign land. Um, but we live, I'm at a, at a Lutheran school, I'm a principal of a Lutheran school there, about 500 and some students um, in the Lutheran school. And so still in the ministry, ordained, so I'm one of those anomalies that I'm actually an ordained pastor, um, but I'm serving in the role of principal in this Lutheran school in uh, Lakeland, Florida. Okay, so here's what you're going to do. I'm going to have you talk across the table and talk to somebody. Um, if you want to talk to yourself, that's fine, but you know, we may question. Um, so find someone close by to talk to. Describe what you think to be the natural world and then the spiritual world. So in your understanding right now, if you hear those two terms, natural and spiritual, what would you say those are? And I'll give you a few minutes to turn and talk to somebody uh, next to you. Oh, you just spread this. You know, that, that says what the Okay, we'll come back in three, in two, in one. Okay, 
So you may have had a chance to talk, or you're going to realize the person you were talking to it wasn't a turn to talk, it was just one person talking, one person listening, and you ran out of time, which is fine. You all have your ideas. When we think about natural world and spiritual world, I want to come into 2 Kings um, 6. And if you want to open up your scripture, I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing, but 2 Kings 6, there is, it is when Elisha was really causing trouble with the Arameans. And so there was an army, Aramean army sent to capture him because he kept eluding the king, the enemy king. And this is that story where Elisha wasn't scared. There was an entire army that was surrounding where he was, and they were pretty sure they were going to, to be able to capture him. And then picking up in around verse 15, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, Behold, an army of horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. When Elisha prayed, then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. For me, and I think at the core of natural world and spiritual world, is what do we let our eyes see? Or more importantly, what are we not seeing when there is all of this that keeps us busy and yet just beyond the veil of where our eyes are kept from seeing on a regular basis there is an entire spiritual world around us that is interacting with us that we just don't need to see until god says like to the sermon now your eyes are open and you see a bigger picture I, for one, believe that's not a one-off. I truly believe that we are surrounded by a host of chariots and fire and fallen angels. It's not somewhere out in space in heaven or somewhere in the center of the earth, but that spiritual realm is just beyond our vision. And if at any moment God wanted to say, see, we would see exactly what that servant saw, that there's so much more right in front of us. So that's how I approach spiritual warfare. It's not something out there. It's something right here. And there are those forces that are pressing in and those forces that are pressing back. And we are protected at some point. But I think that protection also makes us a bit blinded and oblivious to the depth of what we can do in the power of God with the gospel. And so this enemy army is outnumbered. They end up being blinded. And so the army that is with Elisha is able to capture them. And here's the other part of what I think spiritual warfare is all about. And so Elisha leads, the, leads this blinded army into Israel and says to the king, do what you want with them. And the king says, should I kill them? And Elisha said, I would just rather suggest you feed them and send them home. Because I'm pretty sure this entire army is now fairly overwhelmed with the power of God. So why would you kill those who are like, hmm? That God is pretty strong. Send them home completely humbled and ready to say to their king, I think we got the wrong God. <laughs> Which tells me once again, spiritual warfare isn't about crushing. It is about opening the eyes of others with love and food and forgiveness and then sending them out to then free others as well. It's not to grab our enemies and crush. It's to grab our enemies and free 
just like Elijah did there. So my approach is gospel, freedom, resurrection, not crucifixion, done, crushed, hunt, which we'll get to. Any questions there? Okay. Two spiritual kingdoms. When we think of two spiritual kingdoms, and we think of spiritual warfare, here's what we probably think of. Satan. Demons. And all the people that are harassed and following Satan and demons. And our focus is on Satan and the devil. And the devil made me do it, or the devil made them do it, or the devil's taking over. Can we, can we stop giving him more credit than... He doesn't need that much credit. Nor does he need that much attention. Not that we are oblivious and think hell doesn't exist, because we're not that. But the more we focus on Satan, our eyes are not in the right place. And so spiritual warfare isn't so much about learning about Satan. I don't think. It's not bad to know the enemy. But I think really what we need to understand is the power of the triune God. We need to see what God does, God's design, which is what we're going to really focus on tonight. And the fact that as Elijah pointed out to his servant, there are more of God's side than the enemy army. And so if we realize we are not outnumbered, when I hear people say the Christian voice is being lost, it, it, excuse me, God and his angels, they're not being lost, which we're going to talk about. When the church gets discouraged that the world is taking over, we are not outnumbered. There are more of God's side. Now, we may not see them, but the angels are walking around going, I wonder what's going to happen. When we begin to fear what's going to happen to the church, that's simply, once again, a spiritual warfare attack to get our eyes off of the power of God. <clears throat> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, his angels, and the invisible church. The Catholic Church, Church Universal, which I think is pretty powerful understanding of the church in that it's more than just us. It's more than the LCMS, LCMS. It's, it's even those like ELCA. It's even the Catholic and the Baptist and the Methodist and the Anglican. Like, we all have the same triune God. And so at some point, we shoot ourselves in the foot and wonder why we're limping, because we are dividing ourselves. Things like, I don't need to do that for them. They, they are perfecting division. When, oh yeah, their numbers are more, but they just don't play nice together. And if we got our eyes back on God, and, and trust me, I, like I said, I am LCMS through and through. Room. If you had cut me back when our LCMS cross was purple, I would have bled purple. I guess now because we changed the logo, I bleed blue. Um, but I am deeply LCMS. But I also think God probably didn't get confirmed in the LCMS. Just, just thinking. And he's pretty good with the whole salvation thing. So if we get God... We're going to be at a really good good place. Okay, so how did this whole war start? This is where people interpret scripture in a few different ways. I'm going to go to a place in Isaiah that I think lays out exactly the same issue that we have today. And so I'm going to put some lines up here. It's Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, but I'm going to just line by line kind of put some, some of the scripture up. I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne. So as you hear that, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne. 
That is not Jesus talking. That is not God the Father talking. That is a prophecy against a foreign king. But it also gets applied to Lucifer. So if you begin to look at, I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne, turn and talk to people next to you. And if you didn't get a chance to talk now at your turn, I'm telling the person who talked the whole time before, now you're the listener, um, just so that it stays fair. What attitude screams through those words in Isaiah? I will raise to the heavens, I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne. Just talk to someone real quickly about what attitude do you hear, either in a king, as it's written, or in reference to Lucifer in these verses? Keep talking or listening or switch back and forth. I'm going to put some more of those verses up. You can read and then keep thinking, and what does that do to your thinking as you read more? I think I used NIV. Yeah. Get everybody out of my way, and I'm gonna get one. See what it says. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He also hasn't done it yet. Because he says, I will. Not I have. Hasn't happened yet. Okay. So the whole verse, the two verses I put up. I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne, I will raise my throne above the stars of God, which in some commentaries that stars of God can be connected to the stars talked about in Revelation, if we're looking at the stars falling, and so can be seen as um, uh, uh, a symbolic version or a symbolic vision of, of angels. So I will... Um, raise my throne above the angels of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the north. Another translation has north and a specific location, which would have been a sacred um, location in the northern part of the um, kingdom of Israel. Um, a Canaanite holy spot, so not a, not a Jewish holy spot, but it's sometimes referred to as a, as a Canaanite sacred space and so it goes back and forth between the north and the sacredness but that's if you unpack the hebrew it, it can go either way with what he's referring to and then i will ascend above the tops of the clouds i will make myself like the most high what does that scream to you equal to god pride above god I am my own God. I am my own God. I don't know that that's so different than what we hear from a lot of modern culture today. When we talk spiritual warfare, and this is where I step into being offensive. <laughs> And I, we'll get to gospel, but I'm just going to lay it out there that um, I get to decide for myself what gender I am. I get to decide for myself who I get to love because God made me this way, which we'll unpack later. The moment I begin to say, this is what I want... 
weren't no different than Lucifer. Spiritual warfare is simply saying, I want to be like God. Which isn't some nefarious thing that's hiding in dark corners. It is on billboards. It is on TV. It is in our homes every day. It's the choices that we make. Every time we step into sin, it's because I believe that choice is better than the choices that God lays before me. So every time you are tempted and fall, you are experiencing spiritual warfare. Because it's about the design of God, not demons lurking in the corner, but simply us dealing every day with who we are as creation, not creator. And that's the issue Satan had. And it hasn't, he doesn't have a very creative writing style. He has a one note. I want to be an equal or better than God. That's all Satan drums. And he's been drumming it for thousands of years. And we haven't caught on that that's the spiritual warfare that we fight every day of our lives as well. It's... We're going to unpack this more, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to bring a grammar lesson in, but a little bit. Because this is what you need to keep in mind as you think about spiritual warfare. As you look at this, who's driving the verbs? God. Not God. That's the heart of spiritual warfare. Who's driving the verbs in your life and in your choices? And the moment it becomes me or I, are you any different than Satan? No. We're falling the same way. It's about who controls the verbs. And we want that control. And we'll talk about why that is. Well, enough to say because of sin, but we're going to talk about why that is throughout this evening. Okay, so in the beginning, sometime between Genesis 1 and 3, here are some things that happened. Isaiah 14, we talked about that a little bit. There is... Um, a verse in Isaiah 14, 12, you have um, fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth, you who were once laid low to the nations. And then from Ezekiel, it says, your heart became proud on behalf or on account of your beauty. And you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectac spectacle of you before kings. Which, I have to always kind of think. Again, there are times that Carrick's mom or my wife now will say, can you, before you say that out loud, can you step outside so when lightning hits you, you don't burn the house down? Like, just don't do it indoors. But there's a part of me that thinks, God, you have billions of galaxies. You could have chosen like Mars to send Lucifer to. Why Earth? Like you could have, you could have helped us out a little bit here. There's my kind of lack of filter. Um, you have a lot of planets. You even have dwarf planets, Pluto. You, you could have gone someplace else. Why here? And there's a complete reason, because God isn't afraid of Satan. God isn't sitting there going, oh no, what is Satan going to do? He's, he's just not. And so when we become afraid of something that God said, eh, humans and Satan, figure it out. Not being cynical, but if, if he was that dangerous and completely uncontrollable, do you think God would have gifted him with this? I don't think so. So there is something in this spiritual warfare that if we focus too much on Satan, we're going to say, why did he get sent here? Or we say, huh, God doesn't do things by mistake. God does things with design. And what is the design in that purpose? To drive us right back to the source of our salvation. Not to have us run around afraid, but to remind us we can't do this alone. We need somebody else driving our verbs. 
And I'm not saying that Satan is a gift from God. Satan is one of those things that God allows us to drive us back to him, to God. When we realize we need God driving the verbs. And so this all happens, and then we have the whole, well, let's do this. Okay, the attributes, just to keep this straight. Get a little bit of long gospel here as well. God's attributes. Omnipotent. We've heard that before. Omnipresent. Omniscient. Now, to unpack some of that and make it realistic, here's how I approach that when I was teaching confirmation, when I teach this, is that omnipotent is that God is able to do what he wants to do. Not that God can do all things, because God can't sin. And you, you, you talk to an eighth grader in confirmation, they're going to try to do the whole chicken and egg thing. Well, if God can do anything, God can sin. God can't sin. Well, then God can't do everything. Stop. <laughs> God can do what God wants to do. That's, that's what it means to be omnipotent. He has the power to do what he wants to do. We don't. There are certainly things that we want to do that we don't have the power to do, because we're not omnipotent. It's not that God can do anything. He can do anything he wants to do. That's important. Why would he want to sin? Yeah. He wouldn't want to. But I think the idea is he can do what he wants to do. That's the purpose of being um, all-powerful. And then omnipresent. He can be where he wants to be. He has the power to be where he wants to be. Because if we begin to unpack a bit of hell, hell is where God isn't. Well, if God is everywhere, that once again is a chicken and egg thing. So come back to God can be where he wants to be. That's the whole idea of omnipresent. And then omniscient, God knows all that he wants to know. So once again, it puts the verbs back into God's court. God can be and do and know all that he wants to do. Which kind of comes back to the whole Yahweh, I am who I am, which could also be in Hebrew, I will be what I will be. Once again, there's that idea of the power and the knowledge and the presence of God to control exactly what he wants to do by design. Now, having said that God knows all things, can be where he wants to be, and has the power to do all that he wants to do. If that makes you nervous, God can see me at any place, at any time. If you get a little nervous about that, yeah, okay, that's me too. <laughs> We're living in the law. That, that's a law reaction. When you think, oh, he, he saw that, oh, that's law. That's law. <laughs> But when we see it as gospel, not that God is watching out for you to make a mistake, but that God is watching out for you. God knows all that you need. God is where you need him to be. And you take it from the point of gospel. This isn't me looking back over my shoulder wondering, did God just see that? Because the answer is yes. And yet he still loves. And so... That's what's really interesting, especially when I'm teaching confirmation, 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, even ninth grade, and people start kind of blushing when, they say, when I say, you know, God sees everything, and they start blushing. I go, yeah, whatever that is, whatever's causing that, but he still loves you, which is actually gospel, not love. Now, if we go to the other side, and we look at Satan, is not omnipotent. He is not omnipresent, and he is not all-knowing. He is bound in space, in place. He's bound in knowledge. And so when somebody says to me, Satan made me do it, I kind of go, what makes you so important that he would come to you? Like, I don't, you're small potatoes. He is not everywhere. Does he have a fairly large following of fallen angels? Yes. But there's still two-thirds on God's side, and there's a third on his side, so God's numbers are still bigger. 
Does he have a fairly defined structure? If you look at some pieces of scripture, yes. But he can't be all places. And so once again, are we dealing directly in reality in spiritual warfare with Satan? We're dealing with Satan's lies. But Satan's probably not coming after me. I'm not that important. I don't know what he's doing, but I'm sure it's not Greg Sawyer. Um, does he have some other people watching out or demons watching out just to make sure they can kind of trip me up? Of course. But then again, there are angels and there's the power of the Spirit to balance that out. Okay. Genesis 3. I don't think I've ever watched the whole show Naked and Afraid. Um, I just don't find that terribly... Well, I find the concept incredibly intriguing. I just don't think I need to see people running around in the dark with, I don't know, GoPros naked. Um, but I think theologically, it's a really smart show. Because it's Adam and Eve after the whole fruit thing. Because I'm sure if Adam and Eve were watching it, they would be like, there was a time we were naked and not afraid. We were in the garden. That was our life. And then the fruit thing happened, and now we get this whole naked and afraid. And so this whole idea of God's design is vulnerability and trust, which that show completely exploits. So you can't go out camping I mean, they're trying to strip down every kind of protection that people would be used to. What's intriguing is that Genesis 1, Genesis 2, whatever that was until Genesis 3 and the whole fruit, there was a complete reliance on I have everything I need and I am safe protected, God's design is good. And then you have Satan entering with already the idea that he wanted to be above God. He wanted to be equal at least. And he comes in watches Adam and Eve, watches the situation, and he begins to think, how do I get them to think that they won't need God? How do I get them to get an arrogance like I have? How do I get more people to follow me? Because the whole concept early on in Genesis is that Satan is, let's change God's design so that you don't need God. Or that you can determine what God should be and must be like. Which, again, is something that pervades our society today. I've had many conversations with parishioners and just people that have a very clear understanding in their mind of what God must be. And I've had people tell me, well, if, if God can forgive Hitler, then I don't want that God. I don't think he's asking your opinion. He's a God that forgives. And I'm not saying that Hitler, whatever, but if you are starting to say, that's not the God I want, guess what? He's not taking your shopping list to figure out what he should be. He is who he is, and will you submit to that? Because Satan didn't. And it didn't go so well for him. And that's the whole idea as we fight the spiritual warfare. And as we live with people in our society that want to say, this is the God I want. We don't get to do that in God's design. You can't say, I don't need God. And you can't recreate God. Nor can you say, I want to act like God. We don't get to do that either. But that's all where Satan is coming from, and that's what we're fighting against every day. We're fighting against lies that try to displace God so that we can be like God. 
and then you are not subject to God's order. Um, there's a a church in, in California that I, I deeply respect, well, less deep than I used to, but I still respect, and maybe some of you know, Bethel Music comes out of that. Bethel Church in Redding, California. Okay. Ken Johnson used to be a solid theologian. He has taken, he has stepped into a place, and I, just, I bring this up because here's the spiritual warfare that we deal with, that I see that we deal with. He has taken the idea of recapturing the world for God's purpose, which is fine. That's evangelism. That's, that's getting our, our house in order to the point that in one of his more recent books, he's trying to help his congregation become like God on earth for the sake of evangelism. And that phrase terrified me. When you have a Christian pastor saying, I want to help you be like God. That's not sanctification. That's what Satan said to Adam and Eve. You will be like God. We, and I'm not saying that we give up sanctification. I'm simply saying here's where that idea of spiritual warfare and the spiritual lies seep into our lives. Another aspect of it, and there's some songs that are out there, um, some mission work being in, in overseas mission, that we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are not the hands and feet of Jesus. So if you look at your hands, there are no nail scars there. There are no nail scars in your feet. Can you just be your hands and your feet who follow Jesus? We have, in the Christian church even, slipped into this, we need to be God here. No, we actually don't, because that's not our role, and that's what Satan began to do in the garden. We need to be who God has called us to be. We need to be subject to his order, and that doesn't mean being him here, because he's already here. And that's important to keep in mind. Okay, so let's go back to the whole fruit. And I, rather than putting up an apple, because we don't know whether an apple, I picked on a lychee fruit instead. Um, which any Asian would say, well, that's not fair, but give the apple a break. Um, and so open your spiritual eyes. And... And you know, then some got kind of fancy when I, when I was in Morocco. Maybe it was a pomegranate. Again, what did the pomegranate do? There's nothing wrong with the pomegranate. Maybe the fruit doesn't isn't around anymore because it didn't go so well because humans couldn't keep their hands off of it. And so Satan comes in, Eve sees it, and she sees that it is good for food. So that first idea of where does spiritual warfare begin, it begins with the flesh. We fight to have our flesh feel satisfied. So as we begin to unpack where are the battlefronts in spiritual warfare, how we deal with the flesh, and how people respond to the flesh is one area of the battle. And then the next is it was good for the eye, which meant that as she looked at it, she in her mind just saw how beautiful it was and it was enticed by its look. So it's appealing to the flesh and it has this beauty in the mind as well. So the next area is that idea of the mind and how we let our eyes drift. And then finally, it goes right to the pride, that soul of you will gain wisdom and you'll be like God. So those are the three battlefields in spiritual warfare. Those are the places that Satan hits in the beginning and still today. So as we look at arming ourselves with offensive tools and defensive tools, it comes back to how do we arm ourselves 
when it comes to the flesh and strength and the body and how do we guard our mind and our eyes and then how do we the most difficult one get our pride under control and that fact that I want to have the same wisdom of God I, I don't need God's wisdom I need to trust that God's wisdom is God's wisdom and by his design I am subject to him I am under him I don't need to understand everything God does I don't need to understand everything God does in my life I don't need him to give me a reason why I simply need to trust that he loves me deeply and that no matter what comes he will see me through it and that's that other part of the area of pride Again, who is running the verbs when it comes to how we deal with strength, mind, the eyes, and, and pride? We'll take a break in about 12 minutes. I'll check it up and stretch. Okay, so Job 1, 6 to 12. I find this incredibly interesting. As we look at the structure of attack, there's Satan, 1, Lucifer, and then a whole bunch of fallen angels. When we look at Job 1, it sets up a really intriguing, a couple of different things that theologically are very interesting, in that Satan is coming in and out of heaven having these conversations. So he shows up and God says, where have you been? Oh, I've been, you know, just hanging out on earth, because he didn't get sent to Mars. And so he's hanging out on earth, and it's interesting that God brings up, well, do you know my servant Job? So is God throwing Job under the bus here? And... Here's what I think is really powerful when it comes to how we deal with spiritual warfare. Job is seen as righteous. Job is seen as deeply loving the Lord and trusting the Lord. And God says, I will pull my hedge of protection back. Satan, do what you need to do. Don't harm him. But I will pull my hedge of protection back. And watch how this man of faith responds. Which says at one level that whenever an attack, a temptation, a challenge comes into our life, if we look at the example in Job, and it's hard to take one story and put it into 7 billion people's lives currently. But it does say at some point, and we know this, Satan can only go as far as God allows. So even when we feel at wit's end, or we feel like we're being overwhelmed, he is being held back and at bay. And God isn't sending him or holding back in order to destroy, but there is a greater purpose. And so that's where I come back to spiritual warfare it isn't about Satan, it's about God growing faithful followers and coming back to say, no matter what comes my way, God never pulls back so far that I'm alone. We are never alone in this spiritual warfare fight because it's simply to grow us i think it's dangerous to think that god let satan do this to prove our faithfulness to him because i've heard that before that temptation and all of that is to prove to satan that that we love god well that's dangerous so that's pretty feeble it's not god needing us to affirm him it's us seeing that god will walk with us no matter what and it's us realizing that in a difficult time god is there and i don't need life to be perfect to remind me that god is there i sometimes need a more challenging situation to realize that's where god is as well god hasn't forgotten me he's right there but that's when satan comes in and says wouldn't god have treated you better 
Wouldn't God have let you touch the fruit if he really loved you? Would, would God really withhold that fruit from you if he's all that loving and caring? Would God really say, look how beautiful it is, but don't touch it? God is holding something back from you because God doesn't really love you. God sees you as a toy and wants to manipulate you. That's what you've heard. And that's exactly what Satan will use when life is sometimes more challenging. And so Job, we know what happens there. Job goes on and on. It gets bad for Job. And yet Job doesn't ever completely just throw up his hands and say, I'm done. He's close. His wife was done with him because he stunk and he was all boiled and sore. But he, for the most part, persevered through. And it, it shows that in the midst of a battle, we don't need earthly things in order to keep us pointed to God. We need that reliance that God isn't giving up on us, even when everything seems to be falling apart. Okay, I think before we go on and examine control, I'll let you, I'll give you about five minutes if you need to go to the bathroom or stretch. It's been about 55 minutes, and in any kind of normal school, there'd be a passing bill. And, um, you know, it's also 7 o'clock at night, so I don't want you to fall asleep on me because we have another hour to go. So get some... So get some coffee. Don't leave and not come back. Um, I'll give you about five-minute break just to stretch and do that, and then we'll pick this up at 7 o'clock.